Thank you very much, uh, first of all, um, to, to Peter for the invitation uh, to come and speak with you guys tonight. Um, if I seem a little bit on edge, it's possibly because the last time I was stood in front of a school principal, um, it wasn't quite so pleasant an affair. Um, uh, I wasn't necessarily the best student in high school. Um, but in, in all seriousness, um, again, as you can probably work out from the slide up there, my name is Stephen Harrington, uh, together with my colleague uh, John Banks. Um, both of us being senior lecturers from Creative Industries Faculty. We're here primarily to, really to um, begin a discussion around social media, the future of learning and the challenges that that future presents for all of us as people wanting to adequately prepare young people for a changing world. Uh, as a way of representing uh, that changing world, and this was a high, highly unscientific uh, way of actually going about this, um, perhaps purely symbolic, I actually ventured uh, to the website that many of our students head to immediately after graduation, uh, if not well before, uh, that being seek.com.au. And I did a little bit of uh, a search for a bunch of different <laughs> jobs that are currently going on that particular website through a simple keyword search. Um, if you're an economist, for example, you might be interested to know that uh, you're competing around Australia for around 20 jobs uh, right now. Um, if you're a statistician or a mathematician, uh, the number is about half that. Um, just out of curiosity, you know, you might be interested to know that there's about 250 ads for school principals going right now, um, which, which is pretty good considering that for uh, people like John and I, the number is around half that, um, not that we'd necessarily ever want to leave QUT. Um, if, however, you have some kind of expertise in social media, uh, you'd be interested to know that that number rises about tenfold. Um, and even if you do actually think that social media is some sort of passing fad or a distraction of some sort, it's clearly a fad that has um, some serious job opportunities. Um, it is, as we probably all suspected, or at least, uh, and again, representing this in, in kind of a, uh, a simplistic way, an area with um, significant uh, growth in terms of employment. And that's not even taking into account um, the other ways in which social media is being embedded into everyday work, uh, which John will talk about a little bit further. Um, so in case you didn't trust your own eyes or your own observations of students in their nat natural habitat, um, all of this, I think, kind of speaks to the ubiquity, and, and again, John will talk a bit more about that, rather than um, the periphery or uh, social media being out there on, on the margins of society, but actually really kind of fundamental to the things that we're doing and the way in which society is increasingly operating. Um, there are, and you know, on the basis of the, uh, the slides that I showed just before, uh, a number of people out there in the real world who are looking for people who understand how social media works, uh, but also how they can make the most of the opportunities that arise from that with, in, well, in terms of engaging with new audiences and consumers and so on. The sort of new connectivity possibilities that are really opened up by um, these new platforms. But that exciting, you know, rather exciting picture doesn't necessarily fit with how we tend to talk about social media as a culture. Um, we hear so much emphasis through, um, you know, the way in which these are presented in the media primarily, that social media is a problem, a source of danger in particular for young people. Uh, and I'm so sure that we've heard those sort of arguments before, I'm not even going to bother pre presenting evidence for them. Um, Things, you know, that we've, again, I'm sure we've heard before, that social media uh, makes people antisocial, um, that there are privacy concerns around, you know, data and all the rest, um, that, you know, people taking selfies is in, in, um, an indication of increasing narcissism. Uh, one of my favourites recently was that, you know, putting heads together and taking a photo could increase head lice transference. Um, um, and, of course, you know, some, some of the, you know, kind of associated issues around potentially damaging people's job prospects into the future. Um, there's a new show starting soon called Catfished, which you might be interested to find out about. Um, there's all the uh, physical effects uh, and damages potentially to young people's brains that we hear about, um, that we don't, you know, people don't have um, you know, the concentration um, that they once had or the attention spans that they once had, um, or people with ADD perhaps. Um, there are, of course, the very real dangers that social media presents around bullying, stalking, and so on. And all of this, of course, taps into much broader moral panics around technology and society. So 
Um, literally in the last few days, you know, we've had all this concern around a meme called Slender Man. Um, before that, only a couple of months ago, we had a concern around something called Neck Nomination. Um, there's all sorts of fun stuff you can find out about later. Um, and a couple of years ago, for example, we were all worried about planking, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, this is again, a, a really prominent way in which social media is actually presented within our culture and, and, and really part of the, the, the conversation that we have around these technologies. Um, it's therefore really no surprise at all that within large organisations, social media is very often presented primarily as a problem that is best dealt with through a prohibition approach. Um, that, okay, we've got staff spending too much time on Facebook, what's the thing that we need to do about it? Well, let's, we just have to block it um, with our, within our intranet. Um, when I speak with organisations, as I've done quite a lot in recent years, the concern that they have, um, and when they approach me, is often to say, tell us, give us the, the, the sort of magical solution about how we can control this problem, um, that in a sense they're, they're looking for an antidote, as the title of this presentation was indicating. Um, they don't tend to think very much about how we can actually harness some of these really exciting opportunities for you know, particular organisations. Um, so within schools, of course, this is a big, big issue and the overriding approach among parents, educators and administrators uh, tends to be towards harm minimisation. Policies that are developed around that, therefore, um, tend to be fairly blunt instruments which don't necessarily acknowledge, again, the opportunities for engaging with students uh, in an increasingly dynamic way. And of course, you know, given the duty of care that overrides primary and secondary education, this is entirely understandable. Um, as parents of young kids ourselves, I know, um, you know neither John or I would ever be you know, so um, or dismissive of those kind of concerns. And you know, that there are genuine risks around social media use that we need to be concerned about, although some are a little bit more valid than others. Um, the point is though, and, and really one of the big things that we would like you in a way to take away from this, com this uh, presentation, is that very often that kind of concern blocks an informed understanding of the phenomenon. Um, in short, while we need to stay vigilant and be aware of what those risks are, we also don't necessarily need to panic. Um, so hence the, the chill pill part of this presentation in terms of the title. Um, it, I think one of the, the ways of, of, of starting to rethink this is that we need to try and start viewing some of the concerns around media change through a much broader lens or a wider lens. Um, and thinking in the way in which people have you know, displayed concern in the past around things like video games, before that, um, things like television. Uh, there was a great book a number of years ago about you know, the plug-in drug. We all need to be worried about television. Um, turns out it wasn't that big a deal. Um, before that, it was comic books. So back in the 1950s, we had people, um, this gentleman in particular who wrote this book, The Seduction of the Innocent, uh, stood before a Senate subcommittee um, in the United States claiming that comic books were primarily to blame for you know, youth delinquency um, and you know, gang violence in America. Um, you know, before that, we had all sorts of concerns about what the telephone might do, being, people being able to talk to each other over long distances. And even further back, we had uh, people getting concerned about young women reading novels in their bedrooms. Um, it's helpful, I think, first of all, or not first of all, but second of all, to get out of our heads any kind of notion that we can somehow stop or control completely social media activity. So hence the, the reason why I have this image here of a whole bunch of people, um, you know, we can try to sort of shape that activity and direct it in, in the way it's supposed to go, I guess you would say, but we can't necessarily control what happens at the individual level. Um, the best thing that we can do is understand what the risks are, as I talked about before, and then deal with those in some sort of effective way. Um, and I often like drawing the parallel here between um, the way in which we think about social media and risk and how we think about risk when it comes to cars. Um, cars are very dangerous things, and I think we can all sort of agree on that, and especially for young people, well, you know, very tragically, a number of people die every year in motor cars. Um, but we accept that we'll never have perfect safety, um, and or have some sort of expectation that people might stop driving. But the point is that people go along to these sort of activities like you see here to try and find out about how to use that technology in a more safe and effective way. Um, I think as well what we need to do is try and avoid some of the idle speculation or in some cases the outright fear mongering um, and look to actual research regarding how and why people use social media technologies. So a really good book um, in this respect and actually one that I would thoroughly recommend to everyone in this room 
um, in part because it's actually free to download online, and that's legally, um, is this book, this book here um, by a US researcher by the name of Dana Boyd called It's Complicated. Now, the title of this book is, is, works on a number of different levels. It was a, a kind of play on the way in which people would define their um, friend statuses on Facebook once upon a time, or at least it was one of the options. But it's also about saying that the issues that are involved with young people and, and um, you know, social networking um, is a complicated picture. And whereas so often what we actually get... Um, in that cultural discussion around these technologies is a simple kind of black and white, this is a problem, we need to sort of stop this and so on. Um, one of the, the more powerful arguments um, is, in a, is in one chapter in particular where she talks about this idea that young people are addicted to Facebook and other platforms. And first of all, she, she notes that we are overwhelmingly positioning teens as somehow incapable of, first of all, being aware of the risks that are associated with what they're doing, but also that they don't have a capacity to maintain a healthy relationship with social media. Um, and she goes on to sort of talk about this idea of you know, addiction and how readily we sort of reach for this term when it comes to um, the use of, of certain things. So um, a good illustration of that is the fact that we would use addiction very easily in this sort of medicalised discourse around addiction, um, which has you know, very certain parameters for, for psychologists, for example. Um, we use that term so easily when it comes to something like Facebook, but we don't ever use that term when it comes to people who really like books or the works of Shakespeare, for example. Um, the more powerful kind of part of, of her argument, though, is, again, there's sort of an irony here that she points out that there is this increased perception of risk in the 21st century society, which doesn't necessarily, first of all, stack, stack up against statistics around crime and, and, and so on. Um, parents today are therefore actually much more protective of their children and tend to control their social interactions much more heavily as a result, again, for the fear that they might you know, sort of encounter someone who's unsavoury. Um, and you couple that with some of the curfew laws and the other um, laws um, and policies around uh, congregating in public spaces for young people, particularly in America, that is, um, and it's therefore no wonder that young people are looking for some sort of alternative. Um, in speaking with young people across America, she actually found, and this is contrary to popular belief, that young people would much rather spend time with their friends face to face, uh, rather than, um, you know, it mediated, you know, via these these technologies which are highly impersonal. But the fact is that a lot of young people simply aren't given the opportunities to be social that their parents had. Um, she then goes on to claim that we shouldn't therefore judge uh, young people who clamour for sociality in ways that might look foreign to adults. Um, and as a really nice segue to John's part of the presentation, um, she also deals with the rhetoric of um, digital natives. It's a word that we hear quite a lot and I recently heard um, at a presentation at a primary school. Um, and actually far from being useful, this idea of digital natives is often a distraction to understanding the challenges that youth face in a networked world because some are incredibly savvy and there are young people out there who really do know how to use these technologies in highly sophisticated ways um, but there are a whole bunch of others who actually know very little. Um, and so again to finish my bit um, she, she goes on to say that neither teens nor adults are monolithic and there is no magical relation between skills and age. Whether in school or in informal settings, youth need opportunities to develop the skills and knowledge to engage with contemporary technology effectively and meaningfully. <laughs> what I'd like to do is share some thoughts and perhaps provoke some discussion around arguments, debates, discussions around the ubiquity of social media. And the challenges and opportunities that Ubiquity is presenting for our students, for our workforces, for our educational institutions. And what I want to suggest is that what we're dealing with here is some quite profound challenges about, around quite fundamental institutional change. And that these challenges are perhaps more significant for us to grapple with than some of the instrumental questions that we might be raising around social media. And I'll, and I'll get to that. Before I get to that, though, I'd like to share an anecdote before I get to the an antidote <laughs> for, uh, with a, an experience I had with social media recently in my household. I have two daughters, twin girls, nine. And I went home last night, caught the train home. We get home and 
we'll look in the door. My wife's very, wife, Liz, is very excited. Ivy, we're doing the right one, Ivy Sharp. Ivy is researching. What's Ivy researching? Rome, the Colosseum. Where's she researching? Go and check her out. Walk into her bedroom, she's sitting there with her iPod. She's figuring out how to access Safari. She's Google, and she's letting me know all about the Colosseum, and how it was built, and when it was built, and what it was made of, etc. How'd you find that out? Google it there. Right. But what really interested me is what she wanted to do immediately was share this knowledge that she'd gained about Rome with friends. Right? She'd figured out how to use FaceTime on the device. I hadn't showed her how to use FaceTime. Mum hadn't showed her how to use FaceTime. Dad's freaking out a bit at this point around, around what the implications are of my nine-year-old using FaceTime. She'd been FaceTiming and turned out with his sister, who was in the room, <laughs> just across from her, talking about, about the Colosseum, etc. So I, I was less concerned. But what's interesting is my response. On the one hand, as a dad, I was proud of my daughter, the, the young budding researcher, using social media in an interesting, fascinating way to learn. At the same time, there was this profound anxiety I had around the implications of that in terms of wanting to protect her. And I think that these two tensions are pulling us quite generally in our, in our teaching practice as, educator, as educators. On the one hand, we have a sense of the profound affordances for collaboration, for information sharing, for access that these tools and platforms provide. At the same time, we are dealing with anxieties around issues of privacy the ethical issues about appropriate uses, the types of things that Stephen's pointed to around bullying, etc. And these are real concerns. And I think that that tension is kind of at the heart of, of my presentation and also at the heart of the institutional challenges we are dealing with. So I want to just refer you to, quickly to the NMC Horizon Report, um, New Media Consortium Report, a yearly report that they put out around higher education, they, they, they've identified significant trends. One of the big trends they've, they've identified over the past few years, and again in this report, is the ubiquity of social media. They talk about it as one of the significant challenges confronting higher education. Why? I think there are a couple of reasons, and, and Stephen's already alluded to some of them. Social media is becoming firmly established as an industry sector in its own right, and there are jobs there. And those jobs require skills. The other reason, and it's an argument that one of my colleagues, Jean Burgess, who was a social media researcher, a prominent social media researcher makes, and I've co-authored with her on this, is an argument that social media is, is quickly becoming what we term an embedded communications infrastructure. It's becoming a significant part of our communications infrastructure and systems. It's not ancillary. It's not something to the side anymore. It's becoming part of the mundane, everyday ways in which people communicate with each other. Yes, the rates of uptake uh, are diverse. The skills around that, the equity and access issues are still quite significant. But we think this is the trend and that research bears this out. So we have an, a quite mundane and embedded part of communications, and yet it's quite new and disruptive, and it has profound implications for education. One of the experiences I've had with students with lecturing, and it can be quite disturbing over the past few years, and it's, it's increased. You can stand in front of students to lecture, and the heads be down on devices. And you, there's an anxiety there for me, of, are they listening to me? Uh, is there back channel tweets or chatter going on about how boring I am? Um, what are they paying attention to? What are they doing? And that can be a quite unsettling experience. One of the ways I've tried to deal with this is I started these sessions with some of my students of showing me your devices, which is pull out your devices, dump them on the table and have a discussion about how you're using them. And that became fascinating with the ways that they were collaborating, working together while I was talking, asking, asking each other questions, sharing ideas on how they can, can do assessment together. It was fascinating, the way they were sharing this information. And so if you can engage students with social media, and we've started to do that, I know some people like Stephen, for example, have been really into this stuff, and, you, and incorporating social media into their teaching and learning, you can start to get the heads coming up, as this picture demonstrated, and the students engaging with you using social media. So there are ways of doing it, and I don't want to talk, talk to you too much about that, because I know that there are many 
amazing things going on in high schools out there and high school teachers doing amazing things that we can learn from around this as well. This, this is just not happening in, in universities. I want to share with you a diagram, a chart that, that um, has really captured my attention over the past year. I've been working with some colleagues here at QUT with transforming our approach to learning, looking at ways to adopt more blended approaches, more online approaches, integrating social media into our learning. We want it to be student-centred. We want the students' experience and the students' learning outcomes to remain central to that. So what we did was we ran some focus groups with undergrads. And we said, undergrads, tell us how you learn. Tell us what your learning ecology looks like. And this was something that a group of, of young, about three or four young students came up with for us. And this fascinated the team. Unprompted. This is their diagram of their learning ecology. Right at the centre of it is the internet, online lecture, online resources, not lectures. Peers, significant. Um, offline resources, other universities' resources. They go into other universities to see what they can offer them, MIT, etc. Still lecture, lectures there, but it's a mix. And they are really harnessing and thinking hard about harnessing creatively and in quite innovative ways at times. The affordances of social media, particularly with the peers, to collaborate and learn together in ways that we are sometimes still grappling to understand, in ways that are quite uneven. I'm not suggesting all students can do this. This is one of the concerns, equity issues, the issues around the quite diverse and mixed digital literacies you may be confronting as an educator, and I'm sure that's going on in high schools as well, that you can't make assumptions that all your students have these skills. You can't make assumptions that all your students know how to learn effectively with social media just because they have a really cool Facebook account. So in all of this, you have these challenges around the centrality of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And I think there's some quite basic stuff going on here about education that's not particularly new. Sure, it's about the affordances of social media technologies and platforms, but it's also about quite basic social constructivist understandings of pedagogy that inform all good education. We know that students learn best together. We know that they like to learn socially, but the environments and the ecologies in which that happens and the, the potential for that and the potential to scale that is changing quite radically. So what I want to do is shift to what I call the wicked problem in all this. And here's, here's a diagram, I'll just touch on this briefly again. What I like about this diagram, I found it on the internet, I like to think with it a little bit, is that it doesn't put the emphasis on the technologies. It puts the emphasis, it tries to put the emphasis on the nature of the connections that the students can make. And I think it, it, it's a phrase I ch try to remind myself in some other presentations I've, I've given is, it's about social media stupid. Right? It's not about the technology. Sure, the technology is important, but it's about the nature of the connections, the nature of the social learning that can occur through those connections that should be at, our, at the forefront of our thinking. I think this captures that a bit. But the wicked problem in all this. I think we're all struggling and learning and adapting with how to deal with these technologies and the emerging student behaviours and practices around it and try to understand what those practices are. I think we need more adaptive organisations and institutions in order to grapple with these challenges and to prepare our students and our educators with the skills and capabilities to take on these challenges creatively, inventively and confidently. There is some evidence emerging that suggests our highly connected and creative students are starting to reject institutionally framed learning in favour of user-driven education. I have some reservations about that. I think it's actually what's really interesting is the two together. The interest-driven peer-to-peer dynamism amongst students and how we can harness that in our formal institutionalised educational settings. Inform the informal user-driven nature of social media though and the complexity involved of drawing these practices and behaviours and indeed students' expectations around that into the formal structured context and requirements of educational practices and institutions, this is not easy. This is the wicked problem. I recently read a, a, a quite thoughtful um, a journal article by Professor Catherine Lumby from Macquarie. It's the article's titled Social Media and Learning and Teaching. It's forthcoming in the Journal of International Communication. And the point she makes that really resonated with me and captured my attention is that those of us, and I believe 
the us she's talking about will probably capture many of us in the room, who are passionate about learning and teaching, about enhancing student autonomy, while ensuring they are educated with rigour and care, we need to grapple with the profound change and what she argues is the, at the change at institutional levels required to figure out how to incorporate social media effectively into our teaching and learning practices and that this actually challenges traditional hierarchical understandings of knowledge dissemination and acquisition. She argues that social media in some ways is incompatible with some of the traditional information dissemination acquisition oriented learning approaches that many of us are still comfortable with. So the problem she suggests is that we shouldn't focus just on the instrumental role of social media. So how we can use Twitter effectively in our teaching or Facebook, sure these are important questions, but she suggests that, that the really challenging questions is the institutional paradigm shifts that may be required in order to assist and prepare our students for this rapidly changing communication landscape. So in conclusion, in grappling with these challenges, I don't want to underestimate the, the issues around cyberbullying and privacy, etc. These are huge issues. These are huge and challenging social issues. But we should not be corralled in our responses or limited in our responses or indeed in the creativity and vision we can bring to dealing with these problems. So I'm not dismissing the difficulty of doing that. But nevertheless, a prohibition and constraint approach alongside a stick our heads in the sand approach or a hope we will th hope that all things will return to normal approach or a sky is falling response, none of these will assist our students or prepare them to take on these challenges and opportunities to be effective engaged citizens and well prepared for the workforce. And it's in this sense that we need to take a chill pill. The challenge here, and I'm borrowing a phrase from, from Peter, our VC, that he's mentioned earlier, is that this is not just about the real world of today. This is about the real world of tomorrow and preparing our students for this real world, and it's coming quickly. Meeting this challenge is not some kind of fanciful, futuristic, panglossian, utopian sense. Everything isn't rosy in the social media world. But meeting it with rigour and a sense of the quite profound and far-reaching institutional challenges that confront us all. The chill pill is to reflect carefully and in a way that's grounded by evidence, the sort of evidence that, that Stephen was talking about. And this isn't easy, there's no magic wand here. It's fraught with difficulties of formulating policies and teaching and learning approaches around emerging volatile sets of technologies and practices within the context of our existing, historically and institutionally entrenched pedagogies, legal and ethical policies. But the reality is it's here, it's increasingly ubiquitous, and we really need to take on these challenges. If the ways in which students access, share, and build knowledge are changing, then we also need perhaps a more far-reaching and robust consideration of how educational institutions, and indeed how we as educators, relate to these challenges. The privacy, security, legal, and ethical questions are real. These are the complex challenges you all know well. You're at the coalface of dealing with these with your students in the high schools. We're also dealing with them in our households as parents. But the affordances of these technologies also transform and blur the boundaries between these places, the boundaries between classrooms, lectures, home. Students want to be able to learn when they can learn on their terms, but still be supported and scaffolded so they can be effective and engaged learners. A prohibition and constraint approach won't help us get all that far, I don't believe. This isn't the antidote. We need to prepare our teachers and our learners and our, well, our students to be informed, skillful, ethical, critical communicators with and through social media. I don't think there's a contradiction there necessarily. We're in this together as educators and I think we can learn a lot from each other. And I'm sure that there's a lot of creative, experimental, adaptive educators out there in our high schools and in our universities. And I think one of the challenges here is to be brave and courageous in supporting them as they experiment and also as they fail at trying to engage students through social media. I hope that's a useful point to stop and start some further discussion. Thanks.